Greetings, New Ma Zion Church family and visitors. Welcome to another virtual Sunday School class from the Cross Comprehensive Review of Sacred Scripture. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, hallowed be your name, for your name is worthy to be praised. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace, for your mercy, and for your goodness towards us. We thank you most of all for loving us and giving your Son, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for our sins, to rise from the grave on that third day with all power in his hands. We thank you, Father, for our salvation and the hope of salvation that is to come. We pray, Heavenly Father, for the salvation of the lost. And right now, Lord God, we thank you for your word. For your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light on our path. We pray that the Holy Spirit will have his way in our hearts as we prepare to study your word on this day. Lord God, we ask for the forgiveness of our sins that we may come before your presence and have fellowship with you. We pray for understanding and for a responsible obedience as your word goes forth. We pray, Heavenly Father, your blessing on this class and every class that exalts the name of Jesus. Lord God, we ask that you will strengthen and guide the under shepherd of this church, that you would bless our church family, that you would bless every member with the blessing that we stand in need of, Lord God. For you are worthy of all praise and all glory belongs to you. For it's in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that we pray. Amen. The date is July the 2nd in the year 2023. To our visitors, our senior pastor, Reverend Larry L. Roundtree II, welcomes you to the New Mount Zion Church family, where we are with God's grace, changing the world through the love of Christ, one soul at a time. God's unfailing love is our quarterly theme. I am Deacon Keith Poe, and I will be serving as the facilitator for today's lesson. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Today's lesson scripture is from Zechariah, the ninth chapter, verses 9 through 13. Our lesson focus. Announce God's peace to the nations. The king has come. Our earthly experience of fatherly love can influence our view of God's love toward us. Some of us did not know a father's love or we received a distorted idea of what a father's love should be. Thus, we may have trouble receiving love from our Heavenly Father. It becomes difficult to trust God and experience the joy and peace He promises. One of the ways we can heal from our past and begin walking in the fullness of God's love is by hiding God's word in our hearts. The 119th Psalm, verse 11. We do this by memorizing and meditating on the Word of God. Paul tells us that as we practice this discipline, our minds can be renewed and transformed. Romans, the 12th chapter, verse 2. Wrong thoughts can be replaced by the life-changing truths of God's Holy Word. Here's a great verse to begin with. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Lamentations, the third chapter, verses 22 
through 23. We are in the concluding lesson of Unit 1. The Prophets Proclaim God's Power with Lesson 5. Peace to the Nations. The Messiah is Coming. Zechariah joined with the other Old Testament prophets providing foreshadowings of the Messiah's story. He spoke about a king riding into Jerusalem as the people cheered for him. Christians and the Gospel writers identified this as a prophetic description of Jesus' arrival in the city on Palm Sunday. Matthew, the 21st chapter, verses 1 through 11. He was announcing the ceasing of conflict between nations and the arrival of her king, Messiah. Unlike such conquerors as Alexander the Great, Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey, a humble animal, not on a horse as a significant military captain or royalty would do. Jesus wanted his followers to think of him as a different kind of king. The Future Hope While Zechariah, the ninth chapter, verse 9, describes the first coming of Jesus, other parts of Zechariah 9 seem to describe his future appearing when he will bring peace to the people and the land. The entire world, from sea to sea, will be called to submit to Jesus' authority. God would deliver his people from bondage. He made it clear who does the fighting. He does. This is his battle, not the battle of men. Zechariah described God's salvation as like a flock of sheep saved by the shepherd, the Messiah. Then the sheep become precious stones radiating beauty in the land. Also, there will be plenty of grain in the fields and fruit on the vines. These promises will come true, for God keeps all of his promises. Section 1 of our study is the life need and is intended for small group discussion. Discuss the difficulty of attaining peace in this world. After you have read the narrative, Peace to the Nations, in your student book, notice question one. Why does lasting peace between nations inevitably fail? Question one invites us to relate our insights about the strife that is seemingly always present between countries. Such causes include the desire to take another nation's territory and or resources, the clash of religions or ideologies, and the cultural prejudice of one group of people against another. A change of government or a different leader can shatter a peace agreement. Question 2. Why is it difficult for there to be peace between people in conflict? Question 2 asks us to reflect on our own experiences, whether we were directly involved in a dispute or had observed an estrangement between people. Hurdles to the repair of a relationship may have been intense anger, the inability to forgive, or irresistible jealousy. An immense amount of grace is needed to overcome such burdens. And question three, how does the peace of Christ transcend even the most bitter hostility between people? Question three focuses on the transcendent power of God to transform people through the divine authority of Christ Jesus as the king over all creation. 
Jesus does this through his teachings. The example of his life during his earthly ministry and what he accomplished when he atoned for our sins and conquered death. If Jesus can restore the fallen to God's grace, truly he can heal any broken relationship. Section 2 is the Bible Learning Study Zechariah's Prophetic Words of Hope and Promise Who is Zechariah? Zechariah, like his contemporary Haggai, encouraged the people of Israel to again start to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. The project had initially begun in 536 BC, but it was interrupted until about 520 BC because of Samaritan opposition and indifference on the part of many of the Jews. Through the ministry of Zechariah and Haggai, the building of the temple was begun again and was completed in 516 BC. Zechariah's ministry began in October through November 520 BC. Zechariah, the first chapter, verse 1. He was also a relatively young man when he began his ministry, the second chapter, verse 4. He was also the son and grandson of priest, and his grandfather's name being Edo, the first chapter, verse 1, also Nehemiah, the twelfth chapter, verse 4. Therefore, Zechariah ministered as both a priest and a prophet as he encouraged the people to complete the rebuilding of the temple. He also encouraged God's people about the welfare of Jerusalem and its long-term future. Moreover, Zechariah challenged the returning exiles to turn to the Lord, to be cleansed from their sins, and to experience again the Lord's blessings. The Arrival of the True King Our scripture lesson begins with Zechariah, the ninth chapter, verses 9 through 13, from the New International Version. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion! Shout, daughter Jerusalem! See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a coat, the fowl of a donkey. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim, and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea, and from the river to the ends of the earth. As for you, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will free your prisoners from the waterless pit. Return to your fortress, you prisoners of hope. Even now I announce that I will restore twice as much to you. Verse 13 I will bend Judah as I bend my bow and fill it with Ephraim. I will rouse your sons, Zion, against your sons, Greece, and make you like a warrior's sword. Zechariah's prophecy paints a glorious picture of God's grace which he will bestow upon his despondent children. The prophet spoke to the Jews, whom he called daughters of Zion and Jerusalem, telling them to vocally express their response to God's words both loudly and joyfully. The reason for such praise is that their Lord God promises to send their king to them humbly riding on a donkey, yet exuding righteous and triumphant exaltation. God also vowed to abolish the war machines extending his peace throughout the world. Meanwhile, the Lord will liberate his people from foreign bondage, returning them to their homeland while doubly restoring their wealth. Moreover, 
he will empower them with the resolution and tenacity of an invincible warrior greater than that of even a Greek champion. Question 4. God's people were to rejoice for what reason? God's people could rejoice because of the arrival of their king. On the one hand, he was righteous and victorious. On the other hand, this monarch was characterized by humility and grace. Question 5. What would characterize the reign of Israel's king? The ruler of God's people will be known for heralding peace. He would do this by eliminating instruments of warfare. Also, his reign will be known for ending disputes and fostering harmonious relationships among people and nations. Question 6. What would God do for his people? The triumphant warrior declared that he would release his people from the waterless pit. Likewise, he would enable them to return to their ancestral fortress. Though once they felt like prisoners, they now had the hope of freedom awaiting them. And question 7. How does Zechariah, the ninth chapter, verse 13, figuratively describe God's people? God's people are depicted as weapons of war. For instance, Judah is portrayed as a soldier's bow. Likewise, Ephraim is pictured as a set of arrows. Even Zion is likened to a warrior's sword. Jesus' fulfillment of Zechariah, the ninth chapter, verse 9. Matthew, the 21st chapter, verse 4, explains that Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem fulfilled the prophecy recorded in Zechariah, the 9th chapter, verse 9. Judah's long-awaited king did not come as a mounted warrior, but as a humble servant of the people. This was quite contrary to the popular expectations of the day. The Jews were looking for a military conqueror to overthrow their Roman overlords. While Jesus was the promised Davidic king, he was much more than this. He was also the sovereign lord of the universe. Despite Jesus' greatness, he was unmistakably different from the earthly rulers. In the first century A.D., earthly rulers were guilty of slaughtering thousands of innocent people to bring countries into fearful subjection. Also, those who survived the carnage were hauled off into slavery. In contrast, the son's claim to sovereignty did not rest on political or military subjugation, but on his holy character and wholehearted submission to the Father's will. Perhaps nowhere did Jesus' distinctiveness become more apparent than when he rode into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey. Matthew, the 21st chapter, verse 5. Donkeys in the Bible Donkeys are important in the Bible. From Balaam's startling dialogue with the donkey who refused to defy God, See Numbers, the 22nd chapter, verses 21 through 39, to Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem on a donkey. See Mark, the 11th chapter, verses 1 through 11. In biblical times, donkeys were a symbol of labor, peace, humility, and even royalty. According to the New International Version, there are 142 references to the donkey. Furthermore, other than the serpent in the Garden of Eden, a donkey has the distinction of being the only animal that converses with a human in the Bible. The Lord's Deliverance of His People 
Zechariah, the ninth chapter, verses 16 through 17. The Lord their God will save his people on that day as a shepherd saves his flock. They will sparkle in his land like jewels in a crown. Verse 17. How attractive and beautiful they will be. Grain will make the young men thrive and the new wine the young women. Zechariah used the analogy of a shepherd and his sheep to portray the relationship of Almighty God with his adopted children whom he delivers from harm. In fact, his people will sparkle like jewels on a crown in the land of their fathers. They will truly be resplendent with beauty. Indeed, their young men will prosper with the abundance of food and their young women will bloom with the outpouring of wine. Question 8. What future awaited God's people? Previously, God's people experienced deprivation and exile. A future day was coming, however, in which their Creator would deliver them and end their plight. He would be to them like a shepherd who rescues his sheep. Question 9. What regard would God have for his people? In a future day of restoration, the Lord would regard his people as being precious in his sight. To him they would be like exquisite jewels in a crown. For this reason, the Creator would enable them to grow and thrive in the promised land. We will now share three Bible extras. Number one, crowns in scripture. Zechariah the ninth chapter verse 16 declares that one day God's people will be like jewels in a crown. There are four kinds of crowns described in the Old Testament. The first type, referred to in this verse, was worn by the high priest and Israel's kings and was usually made of a light gold plate engraved with words of consecration. This crown was often worn over a turban. Exodus the 29th chapter verse 6, Leviticus the 8th chapter verse 9. The second type was a wreath of laurels or flowers and usually was worn at banquets and festivals. A third type of crown was worn in battle by Hebrew kings. Usually this was a band of silk studded with a few jewels. Second Samuel the first chapter verse 10, Second Kings the eleventh chapter verse 2. The last type of crown was massive and heavy. It was usually made of silver and gold and decorated with many jewels. This was the type of crown that Zechariah created for Joshua the high priest. Zechariah the 6th chapter verse 11 and verse 14. Number 2. An Overview of Zechariah An overview of Zechariah enables us to see how this week's lesson fits into the overall scheme of the book. In the first part, chapters 1 through 8, the prophet told how God gave his spokesperson eight meaningful visions to help his people overcome their problems. Some day, the Lord's chosen king would again rule Jerusalem and all the nations would turn to the Lord and become his people. Yet, for now, God had chosen Zerubbabel to be the governor and Joshua the high priest. In turn, they were to oversee God's people. In the second part, chapters 9 
through 11, the Lord promised he would punish many of the nearby nations and the leaders of Judah who had been unfaithful. In the third part, chapters 12 through 14, the Lord gave Zechariah messages about a time even further in the future when Jerusalem and Judah would be attacked by all nations. Many of the people would perish, but the Lord would appear to rescue his people. At that time, the remnant would turn to God and he would forgive them. And number three, the essence of Zechariah's prophecies. Even though God repeatedly commanded through his prophets the importance of showing justice, mercy, and compassion before the exile, the people spurned his words. Rather than take God seriously, the people obstinately turned away. Zechariah the seventh chapter verse eleven, Deuteronomy the ninth chapter verse six, verse thirteen, and verse twenty seven. It's as if they placed their fingers in their ears to prevent them from hearing what the divine spokespersons preached. See the fifty eighth Psalm verse four, Isaiah the sixth chapter verse ten, the thirty third chapter verse. 15. The essence of Zechariah's prophecies to the people of his generation was clear. If they continued to disobey the Lord's decrees as recorded in the law of Moses, they ran the risk of experiencing God's judgment instead of his blessing. His spokesperson urged the returnees from exile not to imitate the behavior of their headstrong and disobedient ancestors, or the returnees might suffer similar fate. Zechariah the seventh chapter verses twelve through fourteen. Section three is the Bible application. Comprehend the peace God brings to the world. True peace can be found only in Jesus, for he is the promised Prince of Peace, who invariably ends strife and heals relationships. Once you have read the commentary on A Special Kind of Peace in your student book, how will you answer the following questions? Question 10. In what ways do you perceive Jesus as king? Question 11. How was the peace of Jesus manifested in your life? And question 12. Why does the peace of Christ inspire you to share that peace with others? For question 10, it undoubtedly includes Jesus' divine royalty his majestic power, and his care and authority over his followers. Question 11 encourages us to reflect on how Jesus' peace calms our souls and infuses our relationships with others. And question 12 asks us to comprehend our calling as Christians to impart Jesus' peace in such ways as conveying the good news that Jesus can save us from spiritual discord and promoting his peace in a world full of suffering and sorrow. Section 4 is the life response. Proclaim Christ's peace to others. We may not fully grasp the peace of God which transcends all understanding, Philippians the fourth chapter verse 7, but we can certainly appreciate the impact that it has on our lives. When circumstances trigger extreme anxiety, divine peace calms our nerves. When tension hurls us at odds with someone, divine peace soothes our temperament. And when a situation with God distresses us, divine peace restores our faith. The peace of Christ is a balm for all our troubles. 
The key verse of our lesson for today, Zechariah, the ninth chapter, verse 16. The Lord their God will save his people on that day as a shepherd saves his flock. They will sparkle in his land like jewels in a crown. Praise the Lord our God for blessing us with another opportunity to share in the study of his holy word. I pray that you were encouraged as the word of God went forth in our lesson today. We thank God for you joining us and for supporting the Sunday School Ministry of New Mount Zion. If it's the Lord's will, we invite you to join us for next week's lesson from Matthew, the 12th chapter, verses 22 through 32. Think about how God's church can become more united. We know God's love in the way he speaks to us in truth. Listen and respond this week. We will now close out our day's session as we look to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the peace that we have with you through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As our lives intersect with others, we ask that you would guide us as we share the peace that you so graciously provide. We pray for that day when our Lord and Savior will bring everlasting peace to the world. In Jesus' name we pray. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, and whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Amen.